we go. My guest today is Matt Falloon. He is boldly leading the balloon world into the 21st century with Arduinos, servos, and 3D printed basically everything. Today on the show, we're going to have a sneak peek at his balloon bayonet version 3, and we're going to check out the really insane model making project he's been working on. It's going to be a great show, pals, and I have a question for you. Can I just make my own talk show? Hashtag apparently I can, and I just did. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Dave Bren Show live. That is right, the show is live, and of course, joining us live is the uh, inaccurately named live studio audience watching us from home via chat. Uh, thank you so much to everybody watching the show live right now. If you want to watch the show live, be here in the comments section. All you have to do is head on over to patreon.com slash Dave Bren. Uh, I post the links to my live shows up there uh, every time there's going to be one. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is the amazing Matt Falloon. Now, if you don't already know who Matt Falloon is, where have you been? Like hiding under a rock? If you're as much of a, a, a gearhead and a gadget guy and a, just likes to figure it out on your own type of balloon artist, uh, then Matt Falloon is probably the kind of balloon artist that is going to appeal to you. He's not just a balloon artist. He has a wide variety of skills from uh, engineering to dealing with uh, computers and Arduinos and servos, uh, creating all kinds of interesting gadgets and gizmos to solve everyday problems around the balloon house. Um, and today we're going to take a look at some of, uh, some of his uh, exciting new projects. He's got this crazy uh, model making project that he's been working on. We're going to take a look at that later in the show. Uh, but I'm super excited because in the mail this week, this showed up. Now, if you don't already recognize this, also, where have you been? If you're a balloon artist, this you should know by now that Matt Falloon's uh, balloon bayonet is far and above the best balloon cutter on the market. Uh, not only because it's completely unique and original, and he completely came up with the own, his the design himself, 3D printed it, and has been developing it. This is now Mark III. He's been coming up with new ways of making it uh, work better and function better for what we do for a living. And it also comes in cool custom colors. Everybody knows orange is my favorite color. The only reason I don't have orange nails, actually, for the show is because it, like, blended in too much with the background stuff, so I wanted the white to pop, but really, orange is my favorite color. Thank you for that, Matt Balloon. We're going to get more into that in a little bit. Um, and uh, I also, oh, oh, okay, so before we get into that, so Matt is my guest on the show today. Last week on the show, I had Sam Cremines. Also, uh, kind of a gearhead in the balloon world, likes to make his own gadgets and gizmos. Um, and then the week before that, I had Larry Moss. Also, <laughs> a gearhead balloon twister likes to make gadgets and gizmos. And I got to tell you, I just started feeling um, a, little, uh, a little inadequate. I, I haven't really created uh, like anything that I would consider like my own... Well, I guess years ago I did. I, I made like some like carts for my balloon storage and stuff, but that, that, that was about it. So I wanted to kind of prove <laughs> that I could actually make something useful and functional with my balloon skills and also my, my other uh, sculpting and engineering skills. Um, <clears throat> And actually, the problem I want to solve today is this microphone situation. I'm, I'm going to unclip it from my lapel here. So the issue with the microphone here, I can, uh, oh, now this is close to my mouth. I can even take the levels down a little bit more, just like that. Uh, see if anybody shouted anything in the comment. No, OK, good. I just want to make sure no one is like, ah, I can't hear you. 
So the microphone being on my lapel, it's an issue, right? Every time I move, it probably it makes little noises and stuff. And so what I've 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 always wanted one of those cool like boom microphone situations that you see uh, podcasters have, but I don't have that much money on the show. Uh, I'm trying to change that. By the way, patreon.com slash Dave Bren. Um, help me. Uh, this is a not-for-profit, and we're trying to change that. That's not my joke. I shouldn't use that. I stole that. Okay, here we go. Um, I have made my own boom mic using my balloon ingenuity, and here it is. I have, uh, these are yellow 350s cut into approximately uh, five inch segments and then tied and they are tied around black hangers, uh, preferably black so that it kind of blends in. You don't want to use those white hangers and then it's just going to stand out. And you see there's three on the bottom to make this nice little triangle. And then we've got two up here, and this just very conveniently sits on my table. Here we go. Microphone clips right here. Perfect. Send the wire up there so it's not in the way. Hey there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the smooth sounds of Radio 260. How you doing? Well, uh, if you weren't already aware that I literally do everything on this show just to amuse myself, uh, this ought to make it abundantly clear. All right, that's enough goofing around. I've got a really great guest on my show today, and we should really get to it. Let's head on over to the magical land of Zoom and hang out with my pal, Matt Falloon. Matt Falloon, welcome to the show! Hello! I... Can I, I just I just want to start by saying how blown away I am by that ingenuity uh, that you've seen there. I, I feel like it needs a Dave Friends Show logo on it, like taped to the not like professionally printed, just hand drawn on like a chip packet. Oh yeah, and, like, I mean maybe on the side, obviously hand drawn. That's that's the way to yeah. go in my show. But not on a clean piece of paper, just like on a piece of paper that you've spilled coffee on and tried to like make a pen work <laughs> on the side and just. Just stick that on with the sticky bits of post-it notes that you've ripped off because you couldn't find tape. <laughs> I think that would just complete the look. <laughs> can I use? Should I? Oh, can I use a ripped-off piece of um, of my lint roller to tape it on? You can use whatever you like as long as you don't try to disguise it as something more high quality than it is. Oh no, no, I would never dream of doing no. something like that. Absolutely not. Yeah, we need to know our limits. Yeah. Um. Thank you, <laughs> Matt. Thank you for being Hi, here. Dave. <laughs> um, thanks for thanks for joining me. I know it's early for you out in Australia. It is what t nearly ten in the morning for you. It must be at least. I love the entertainer lifestyle you lead. It's 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 twenty past eleven in the morning. Ooh. I don't know who this is early for. <laughs> I mean, Can I, I do... actually I want to share a story because. Dave, every time I visited uh, California, Dave would, would very happily put me up in his house. And um, it was the time I'd visited, and I was sort of new and fresh and keen to the I'm staying on, on, on Dave Brent's couch. And he is one of those house guests who, if he wants to sleep in, he's going to do it regardless of who <laughs> is in the house with him. And so I found myself for the first, I'm going to say three hours of the day, wandering around a stranger's house with nothing to do and so I cleaned his kitchen just <laughs> because it needed a clean and I spent my time productively cleaning Dave's kitchen so I'm a good friend to have I think you're an amazing friend um <laughs> and I make no apologies for my behavior <laughs> uh, I... <laughs> which is why 11 a.m is early yeah, yeah. Mm. um mm. what are you drinking there I'm drinking um, Nespresso pod coffee. Oh, cheers. Yeah, I'm like, drinking water. It's like the liquid equivalent of pod people. <laughs> Yummy. Mm. 
Not great. Um, that... All right. So, Matt, I, um, I wanted to talk to you today about some of your – so, I, I mean, one of the things that really amazes me about you, um, and I even think back to, like, before we even know each other. Do you remember when we were just uh, casual acquaintances on YouTube? I don't even think it got as far as casual acquaintances on YouTube. I was just trepidatiously reaching out and dropping your name occasionally, and then you dropped my name back, and I squealed. <laughs> well, uh, the the feeling was mutual. Um, <laughs> I thought you were amazing. Well, and because you uh, you were doing a thing that I that I always. Um, that always draws me to any particular artist, which is it, it was obvious that, yeah, you were good at balloons, but it came from a place where you were like good at a lot of other stuff and had like this very kind of engineering approach to stuff. Um, you know, the the thing that we first connected on was that like geo donut mm -hmm. frumple twisted dinosaur head thing that you had come up with or frog and whatever. We kind of went back and forth. Um, and there was like a, a level of, looking at that balloon and saying, yeah, that balloon can be something else if I do this really weird, insane thing to it. Um, and that's what I, and that's what it, like, I really has always appealed to me about your work. Um, oh, thank you. Like I would say, I was thinking, I was thinking about your, like your, your, like your catalog of what it is that you've created and like something to describe everything that you do seems to be, you fall into either one of two categories, which is either, it's deeply interactive or it's deeply emotional. Like it will touch you in some way that is like either oh. super cute vibes or, oh my God, that looks just like that vibe or, um, or that's like so interactive or engaging like with pop-ups or picos, things like that. Okay. Um, tell me I a mean, little bit about... My, my style... It, as far as I can call it a style, I'm, I'm I'm one of these artists who's very uncomfortable giving himself props. So I'll I'll start sure. I'll start by saying that. But I think my style has mainly been driven by Facebook, and I say that in the sense that it became when I first started getting into balloons, um, the common thing to do was here is a frog that I made, and then the next six posts would be a people saying I make a frog too. Here's my frog. Right. Or is this how you did it? Is this how you did it? And they post photos of their version of um, of what you've done. And I I eventually found that annoying, and so I just started trying to come up with stuff that couldn't be reverse engineered from a picture. And that really drove my style because once you start trying to do things in a way, not just photograph them in a difficult way, but but trying to do things in a way that you can't with your brain physically untangle how that was done that just opens up a whole new world of what you can do with balloons. And then when you do it regularly and frequently, you, as you know, with anything you do regularly and frequently, you, you, your speed picks up and your confidence picks up. And, and, and you can do a lot of that stuff out on the job now. Right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, in, in regards to like the kind of adding these things, it's like you're adding new tools to your toolbox oh, every absolutely. time. You know, yeah. you're just like giving yourself as many opportunities um, to create as you can. Um, speaking of tools, uh, I kind of wanted to pick your brain a little bit about, um, you know, this other side of who you are as an artist and a creator is like the kind of mechanics and engineering side of things. Um, and, you know, d getting deeply involved with creating, using Arduinos and switches and LEDs and all kinds of things to like create your balloon kit. Um, sure. But it also kind of comes from this model making fascination of yours. So I wanted to I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. My my father taught me that if you can do it yourself, don't pay someone to do it. And the great thing about dad is is he couldn't do it himself, but he would try. And um, he he didn't he had the self belief that that um, I've inherited from him. Um, his ability didn't match his ambition. Uh, with a lot of things, and so I, I also learned to swear from my father based on um, a lot of his DIYing. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it got to a point where it was something that I started doing to amuse myself, and whether it was sewing a puppet or you know building something out of wood or whatever it was. And my parents were always 
they're like mum wouldn't let me use the sewing machine and dad wouldn't let me use the fancy tools in the workshop so I did what I could rather than getting discouraged I did what I could with the tools that I had and then once more and more of those tools started becoming available to me I started uh, learning that and it's it's really just it, it comes as a constant surprise to me when I make this stuff which I just do for my own interest and I haven't studied in it and I haven't learned anything more than what you can get for free and it always surprises me that other people set their own limits with stuff and listen i'm just as guilty i hate doing my own tax i'm not particularly good at it right and i have great admiration for accountants as much as accountants are the butt of every employment joke they do things with numbers that that just make my hair stand on end yeah but well i think that my cat is the accountant for this show so that's not uh that's that not explains that a, a bit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so where was I? Yeah, so I, I once you started, and then you start working, and you start earning money, and you start buying tools yourself, and you're like, I want to make that thing. I want to make that thing that I could buy for sixty dollars. I know, I'll buy the sixteen hundred dollar tool, which will <laughs> let me make that thing that I could buy for sixty dollars, and I'll learn how to use that tool adequately. Yeah. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I actually have written down here in my note in my notes. <clears throat> I was like. Matt Falloon is one of those buy the right tool philosophy kind of guys. Like, it, it, to you a know, certain, like I, I've often said, uh, you know, there's there's a tool for every job, the right tool for every job, and if you don't have the tool, modify the job to suit the tool that you have. <laughs> so, don't, oh, interesting. That's a different yeah. approach. So don't let lack of resources stop you from, you know, if you're really keen to do the thing, just make it work. It's sort of this, you know bend your will around reality kind of mentality, which actually has yielded positive results. Um, I figure nothing's a waste if you learn something. So I've got a lot of scrapped projects that I right. can look at. And I, I, I'm one of these guys who doesn't throw a lot away. So especially like I've got a failed silicon mold sitting up on the shelf somewhere. And I look at it and like I can't ever possibly use that. Bindi the echidna, the puppet, mm. was originally going to be um, less Muppety and more more Jim Henson creature shot looking. Right. Uh, but the molds didn't work out, and I learned a lot about silicon molding by having that failure. And so I keep it there as a little reminder. So, yeah, I, I just try everything. And, yeah. you know, I learned to shape leather because I needed to make shoes for a model. And so I just learned to shape leather. Wow. And YouTube. I mean, you know, you're, you're the biggest advocate for YouTube. YouTube's just... You can put yourself through college with YouTube. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Not financially, um, but... Um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's absolutely true. You can learn anything here if you have that mindset and that, mm. that intention of being like, I can learn this, so I'm going to make this happen. And, and uh, when um, printing started happening and those machines started to get around the you know, sub-$2,000 mark, I thought, well, here's a magic bullet. I can throw away all of my other tools and just 3D print everything. Right. And yeah, what was that like start. for you, like getting your, getting your first 3D printer? Like, Again, it was the ambition you have for the device outweighs its actual capabilities. And that's something sure. that not, not a lot of people are saying out loud about 3D printing because it's this big world-changing, you know, you're going to be and, – and people don't talk so much about that anymore – but when it first came out, it was like every house is going to have a 3D printer. And if you need a replacement part for your car, they're just going to email you the file and you're going to make it yourself. And, and it was going to be this new manufacturing revolution, which it, it never is and never was. Uh, and that's because of the huge limitations of, of what it has. So what I've found is by owning 3D printers, you suddenly have your scope widened to all of the things you don't want to 3D print anymore. Interesting. So, like, strength is a problem. Say more about that. Yeah, so, so 3D printing, it's, it's additive. For anyone who doesn't know, it's additive manufacturing. So this is uh, version two of my balloon cutter. And this is in two parts. And the reason this is in two parts is because you have to maximize strength uh, across your design. So if I was – here's the bed of my 3D printer. If I was to print hold this – Hold it up to your – hold it up to your – right, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. So if I was to print that like this, mm -hmm. the machine comes down that lays down layer by layer by layer and builds that up. But like wood grain, the layer is the weakest part of the design. So this is very hard to snap this way. 
But if it was right. a longer piece, I could snap it that way quite easily because those layers just delaminate and pull apart right. from each other. And there's different, um, there's different uh, materials that can, you can use and you can tweak the heat settings for each individual material. But the best way to get around the strength issues is to design it in a way to maximize strength. So when I print something like this, that's printing on its side because I need maximum flex in that joint. Right. And this is printing upright because I need to have all of this in here without support material that I then have to carve out. So I'm trying to streamline this piece of getting it to a final product and I'm trying to maximize strength of this piece. Right. And it's... Which is... There's just so much thought to go into it. And then you've got designs that need strength on two axes. So, you know, do I print this diagonally? Do I print it in two parts? There's, there's so much that needs to go into it versus something like silicon casting, like casting in resin. I could just make a mold and pour the resin in and the part is going to come out as strong as it's going to come out regardless of any orientation or temperature in the room or whatever it may be. So it's, it's a really versatile tool, but it's not the tool to end all tools. Right. Uh, it seems like for, for the purposes of like making a quick mock-up mm. of something that, that will be injection molded, for sure. Yeah, there's, there's no um, middle ground. So we've got, the, we've got the very cheap end 3D printing which will make a great part, and if you use ABS, it's going to make a part that's going to last for a long time as opposed to PLA, which is like a corn uh, starch-based plastic, so it does degrade over mm. time. Um, so all my cutters are made with ABS, so it's just going to last forever. Um, right. But uh, what was I going with that? Anyway, sorry, you can go back to that. Um, well, I did want, I actually did want to, because I have... Yeah. Well, someone, some, I just quickly poked my head into the comments. Someone said, uh, where is version one yeah so version one which one this, which one is version this is one? actually version one that's version one and what separates okay. i do I have a version two i don't know if i have a version two around but what separates version one from version two is basically the aesthetics of the thing um this one ah, okay. the little hawk nose the, the little beak is a little bit skinnier on this so that was a common breakage people would drop it and that would snap off which right by and large doesn't affect how it works but it just means there's a smaller space to pull your balloon into and also, right. just stuff that if I had have studied engineering, I should have known. Um, right. This is, let me move my head out of the way. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but that, that arc around the top of the belt clip is not perfectly rounded. Right. And every time you put a corner, that gives you a weak point. But uh, I, was okay. dealing with, I was dealing with an animation software to actually make the 3D mock-up of this. Uh, and I have a friend who worked for Autodesk at the time, and she's like, well, you designed this in 3ds Max, which is an animation character building software. So I eventually down the track did get hold of Fusion 360, which is a, um, a more computer design software. And I use that to basically take this design and streamline it. So the, the Model 2 has got a perfectly rounded uh, arc around the belt clip. Uh, it's got all of these sharp edges on the top. You can see that's quite geometric. And right. uh, there's like corners. That's all been smoothed out and is, is just looks a little bit nicer. Mark II right. was really just an aesthetic change. And then the other thing with Mark II was uh, I discovered quite quickly that you've got the option of printing uh, with various densities. So this is printed with probably 50% support on the inside of this. It's not solid plastic. And that adds to the speed of manufacture and that adds to uh, the lightness of the product but it does it can take away from strength so right. the next model was was upped in the uh in the infill on the inside just to, to build better strength in it, and then the third model it's mind-boggling oh, yeah. to me yeah we're gonna okay let's let's not yeah. let's not jump into the, the third model yet this is the big i'm very excited for this. you know i should say that this isn't a sales pitch kind of interview because this these things while i've got a stack of these things sitting here they're not ready for sale Right. at any stretch yet i mean you can message me and i can send one or two out but they're not they're not with distributors or anything like that so this isn't a sales push kind of thing no yet, I, this is know. this is more for my like personal geeky like i'm so excited yeah. that you are creating this um I, I think it's great well i think it's great for people to see that hey listen if you uh, if you have the ingenuity and you have a really cool idea i mean listen there are ways that you can make your cool ideas happen like Reach out to people and don't like let, balloon. Like you can don't let perceived lack of ability restrict you. 
Yeah. Just because you've never done something before doesn't mean you can't do the thing. You just haven't tried to do it before. And if you aim for perfection, then you're going to fall at adequacy. And that's okay. Like that's that's the step towards you know getting proficient with something. But but by assuming, I get that comment so many times. Oh, I could never do that. And you're like, well, when's the last time you tried? Yeah. Yeah. And you know you've got to feel motivated to try and all that sort of thing. I'm not just saying that everyone who doesn't try is lazy. But you know if you've got the motivation there and you genuinely have a curiosity to 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 build something, just just do it. Just jump in. I mean, hardware's cheap enough at the moment. The amount of stuff that I build from found objects and found material, which we'll talk about with the uh, with the movie prop stuff, um, but yeah, just you don't need all of the uh, you don't need all of the gear to get started. Yeah. And then if you do find a passion for it, that's that's an investment and a hobby that you can put money towards down the track. Um, anyway, all right, let's show it off because I think it's just really cool. Yes, oh, this is the coolest. Yeah. I mean, so this is a big version of the cut. But the, the regular size, they come about this size, but I made a big version to show off. Um, and a couple of improvements that this Wait, hold made. on. So this is, can we, can we, I, I want you to hold it up and then I want you to give me that, give me an O look at the thing. Yeah, right there. I'm going to, uh, hold on. I got to look at it. Which way am I looking? This way. There we go. I think that worked. That's going to be, that's going to be the screenshot be after this episode. Um, I have to be careful with my screenshots because I believe, I think it was Pip or maybe it was Suzanne that uh, that edited an adult toy into my Pico's video <laughs> cover, which was me going like this and there it is. So I, you know, we have trust issues now. Um, <laughs> so this is the old version. And a couple of problems with the old version was the uh, the belt clip if people tried to clip it over, I don't know what they were trying to clip it over, an encyclopedia or something, but people were breaking the back of the belt clip. Um, and so I tried to get around that with version two by making it a little bit stronger. But with version three, I went right back to the drawing board because the problem is there's a latch. There's a little latch that holds the, uh, the front of the cutter on. And the latch actually takes up real estate inside the swoop of the belt clip, the arc of the belt clip. And when I was saying that every time you put a corner into an arc shape, you, you lose strength. So regardless of how strong I made this, that latch was always going to be adding unnecessary corners into the belt clip. Uh. So I thought to myself, how do I latch the front to the back? A, getting rid of this mechanism so I've just got nothing but a plastic arc to, to lock that in place. And B, in a way that I can print it to maintain rigidity, and to make it easy for me to, because 3D printers can't just print in midair. If they come up and you want to print like an L-shaped thing like this, it can't just come up and start printing out here. It's got to build up a little shelf right. to start printing onto. So all of that shelf needs to be removed after printing. Um, so that adds time. And I mean, I spent so many hours of my life shelling support material off these cutters <laughs> in the first place. Anything I can do to um, to minimize the support material while still maximizing maximi maximizing strength. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. So I went from a two piece design to a three piece design, as illustrated by the three separate colors in this example. Right. Um, the latch has been moved off the belt clip, so the belt clip is now one complete arc of plastic with no. Um, there's no corners. There's nothing that's going to reduce the strength of this. Right. And uh, the few people who've already got their cutters have said that this just feels so much stronger now than previous. Oh, yeah. Please don't break it on. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I because I can uh, remember with the first one that you gave me, I remember like taking my first like pull at the belt clip and hearing a little crunch, crunch, crunch of like. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, this feels way yeah. more stable. And and in you know. When I discovered that was a problem with the version one cutter, I did warrant everything. I was sending out a lot of new cutters for people who, who got in touch with me. That has since stopped, so please don't message me. <laughs> At this point, you've had it for a bunch of years. You've got your money's worth. Buy a new one or don't. I don't care. Yeah. But <laughs> So the latch now has been moved to these two adorable little ears, which I makes know. this whole thing look like it's got its little tail and its little ears. It's, it it's is so a little, cute. It's a little squirrel. Your audio cut out there for a second, but I think you said squirrel. Yes, that is what it, it looks does. like. Yeah, it looks like a little squirrel. Um, 
and you squeeze the ears together now and that releases the top part of the cutter which then uh, exposes what I call the antlers. Um, <laughs> and, and again, this solved a few problems because some people weren't aware that uh, they had trouble getting the blade to sit in the right place mm. to lock everything in because with a separate piece, you sort of got to balance the blade in there while you slide the tail piece on. And the tail piece had this little spike which would you know some people could break that off and yeah if you didn't know what you were doing you open this up and cut your thumb on the cutter if you're on the blade if you weren't being careful actually uh, i got a feedback from andrea Knoll, and she's messaged me and she said just so you know i opened one of the cutters one of the old style cutters and i hurt my thumb and i cut my thumb and i thought to myself you're a doctor <laughs> you can deal with it <laughs> i don't know why you're telling me i cut my thumb off and, and i'm not a doctor and i stitch myself up but thanks for letting me know andrea yeah <laughs> that's um, good to know um, so anyway so now what happens is when you remove the top part you've got this little pocket yeah. that the blade sits into i i didn't make a jumbo blade but the blade sits into the pocket so the only way the uh the blade can fall out is if you hold it upside down and shake it it's not going to drop itself out. Yeah. Uh, there's no little spike down the bottom anymore that can break off. And this thing just slides back in place with a little rewarding snap. Um, it is very One satisfying. challenge that I came... It's good, isn't it? A challenge that I came across was every time a part flexes, you've got a weak point. And these two ears, to do what they're doing, they need to flex. Right. And so what I did is I designed the shape of these in a way that you can't ever over squeeze them together because these two little notches are going to touch each other before you squeeze them far enough to snap. Right. And then my concern was if I sent this piece out as a separate, people would drop this, people would lean on it. This is a jumbo version, so these are much smaller in reality. So all of the completed cutters, that is fused to that. Those are, that's one solid piece that you receive. Right. And the only piece that clips off is the... It's the little top this guy, so and then that drops in. Cool. I was very excited because I was gonna like, uh, I wanted. Well, first of all, actually, before I even say, uh, the jumbo version is getting lots of traction in the comments. People are absolutely in love with it. Um, <laughs> I think that is so stinking adorable. And like, this is a just yet another perfect example of your ingenuity because it's like you didn't need to make that big version for any practical purpose other than to easily demonstrate to people how the product works. And it's absolutely genius. It's like a perfect use. Do you want of... to know why I made it? I'm sorry to burst the bubble, but do you want to know my, why I made it? Why? I made it because I'm a massive nerd. And originally I was going to make a little Avengers cast of cutters. And this was going to be the Hulk. And you can see the colors. <laughs> And I was going to have like an Ant-Man one that was this big. And I was going to have all the superhero colors as sort of like an example of the colors that you could, you could use. But um, that idea, eh, like most of my ideas, I'm like, ah, I'll do it on the day. And then the day never comes. Yeah. So that was why I made the big one. I'm like, you know what? I can use this to demonstrate. And then when I'm done, I'm going to do a convention exclusive. If conventions ever happen again, um, I'm going to have basically a like a builder bear workshop, a builder cutter workshop. So I'm going to have big buckets of the separate parts in different colors, and people can put their own cutters together at a convention. And it's like a it's like a build your own Savi's lightsaber workshop experience, but um, but instead of at Disney, it's at some hotel in Kentucky. <laughs> I, that would be great. I would love to do that. That'll be, um, guys, I mean, I love my, my cutter. I would love to get a custom one. Um, I was very excited because I was going to use it on the show today um, and cut balloons mm -hmm. with it. I, also, I had a packet of scraper blades, and I went to grab them right before the show, and... Oh, no! Yeah, they're Wrong. box cutter blades, not scraper blades, but... Uh, that's a good note for you folks at home. If you do uh, get yourself one of these balloon bayonets, uh, make sure you get the rectangular scraper blades, not the pointy. There end. is an image on it of it on the back of the there uh, is of the package. A helpful so, so image, I right won't there. make that mistake, but then I didn't realize that Dave was getting one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, man. So, I mean, like. The, the thing I love the most about this design is I went, um, went through a seat belt.
Mm-hmm. Oh, had, dangerous. Uh, and I had a car that wasn't wasn't allowed to be registered because uh, because the seatbelt got frayed. So, so that was a big thing behind this design was making something that the seatbelt is just going to pass over. It's not actually going to cut in. So if you if you leave this on your belt, uh, you're not going to cut right through your seatbelt and right. fly through the windshield, which is a selling point. It is, and also the fact that it is. A cutter, it, the only cutter that I'm aware of, that you pull towards you as opposed to down, so it doesn't mm-hmm. yank your pants off, which is very helpful as a, a family off. entertainer. I had a, belt, I had a vest pocket, and the stitching would, would go on the vest pocket, yeah. and I was constantly stitching this vest pocket because you know what it's like. You get a blunt blade, and you're like, I'll fix it next gig. I'll fix it next gig. And eventually, you're there yank, like, ripping the balloons in half of your hand. If you get the good quality blades for these, you don't even need to touch the balloon to the blade. It's so sharp that the balloon sees the blade coming and goes, ah, and just, <laughs> and, and splits itself. It's, it's incredible. It's <laughs> the amazing magic of the balloon bayonet. Uh, this is awesome. Thank you so much for sending this to me. I appreciate this. No, you're very, very welcome. Thanks for the mention. Um, I, um, I wanted to ask you, um, because we are, Obviously, we're both balloon artists, so we want to have a little bit of balloon knowledge to share today. So I wanted to ask you what your uh, all-time favorite one balloon animal is, if you have one. Uh, you know, I, I really love, I mean, if you know my stuff, you know I like the functional and the, and the stuff that kids can play with. I really love the old Marvin Hardy guitar with the, do you know that one? Um, oh, with the play with that with the string. I I will I will can make you, it as as taught in Balloon Magic Magazine Volume Two. All right. Sorry, if you're watching, I'm going to teach you design now. I I think I think Marvin would appreciate um, the sharing of knowledge. So how how far do you inflate it? This far. That far. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm an ish kind of guy when it comes to balloon measurement. <laughs> I'm going to say four fingers remaining okay. and give it a stretch. Uh, as, you, as you don't use one balloon designs anymore, I find this is kind of irrelevant now. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it's an old habit goes on. So we start with a tulip twist. Again, I'm teaching this as taught in Balloon Magic magazine. I make it a little bit differently because of the – because of the comments that a single tulip twist on the end of a 260 get, to be honest. Especially when you don't do much with it and you ended with that, that shape remains in place. Uh, and then we're going to come down probably about three hands widths and do two small pinch twists. And again, I mean, we're all balloon artists. We all know the comments you get at this point. Um, I think it was Scott Tripp who said to me, or said in general that if there's an obvious joke to be made as the entertainer, it's your job to make it. I that's think a that's really a, good I think that's an, that's a really good Yeah, I, I like that. So maybe not so much with the balloon that looks like a dick, but if you're if you're making Spider Man and he's got little butt cheeks, as the performer, make a joke about the butt cheeks because that just takes all of the heat off it for the children, and suddenly it's not a joke the children want to make anymore right. because you've already made it better than they will. Right. So uh, yeah, anyway, so at this point, depending on your crowd, you make your joke or you hide it under your arm or whatever, uh, and then we're going to use the remaining length. We'll make a little sort of two finger bubble right down here to the end, and spin this round into a loop. And that's creating sort of the basic shape. And then the piece that makes this really fun is you poodle tail the end of that. So you're left with 160 and a bubble. And then I like to grab it up here nice and close to the joint and just stick my hand in the loop and spin that a whole bunch of time. And what I'm doing is I'm twisting the remaining and better you can have this twisted up you're gonna get and then that goes down and locks itself in and this was sort of like I'm not gonna say it was eye open but 
it was the first time I'd seen balloons to create something really functional. So you can you can pluck the string, and then if you're holding it with your with the palm of your hand against your body, you can stretch this out to make. So yeah, I, and I've I've given this to people who've given it to their dads, and the dad has been doing the uh, the opening riff from Smoke on the Water with it, you know. Um, those this is great, and and it's it's you can scale this up, so you can do this differently, and you can stick. I just changed the head really. I still make this if I have to make a one balloon thing. I'll just do it, give like a triangle shape or something on the head. I won't do the tulip twist, right. but um, other than that, that's still a really quick practical design. Yeah. That um, in terms of something that caught my imagination early on, the the guitar was was. Yeah, a bit of an eye opener. Well, and I mean, a perfect example of what I was saying earlier about your balloon art, which is you seem to do things that are either uh, interactive or emotionally engaging somehow. And uh, this kind of does both, actually. Uh, this oh, is cool. awesome. Thank you for sharing. And also, uh, I mean, so, so, something that I push always in what I do is, um, I, I mean, in addition to just the the importance that I place on teaching and sharing, I also place a lot of importance on uh, putting yourself in a position of learning something that you think you already know. Yeah. And this has been happening to me. It's the reason why I ask people to teach me, like teach me, I already know balloons. So like, what's the point of teaching me a one balloon animal or one balloon thing? Like, yeah, I've made this before. I know how to make this. I also do the head a little bit differently. But one thing I have never done is wound the string up by twisting it around like that. Oh, okay. Um, so you gave me, you just gave me a new thing, like a balloon sculpture that I learned probably 20 years ago. You just taught me like a new thing about it. I, I always and... think it's interesting along the same line, slightly different, but I did a, um, I went to a, one of the last magic lectures I went to because I abandoned magic years ago, but was Sylvester the Jester, Dan Sylvester, when he came to Australia. Mm. And he really outlined uh, his concept of ask an idiot. And I, I really, no, I really love that because it wasn't so much ask someone who you think's an idiot. It was ask someone who has no emotional or technical involvement in what you're doing. Right. And just say, hey, I'm trying to get this to work. How would you do it? And that person can bring such fresh perspective because you, as someone who feels like, you've already developed so much in what you're making, you've, you've built walls for yourself. Like you know that that tool can only do this much and every time I try to do this with it, it doesn't work. So I have to find another way to do that. But those people haven't got those walls built. So they'll be able to look at something in a way that you've never seen it used before and say, well, why don't you do that? And it's, it's the same concept. I mean, legend has it that Da Vinci only ever used to like working with apprentices. And the reason he liked working with apprentices is because he didn't want to work with artists who already believed that they knew everything. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was, yeah, just little things like that. When, when I'm at a balloon jam, I much prefer, I mean, I don't usually make balloons at a balloon jam. I sit and chat with my friends. But if I am making balloons, I like to sit next to the beginners because they're going right. to show me stuff that I have overlooked way back when. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this is great. Well, thank you so much. Well, and, uh, I, you and I, the, it is a little bit of a time moment right now to uh, have a little promo, um, the, just to mention Balloon Artist College because we are both um, yeah. have some content over at Balloon Artist College, um, and the you know we're we're both committed to teaching and sharing as much as we possibly can. Um, Thank you for taking some time to teach me today and hopefully <laughs> teach my viewers at home. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, if you want uh, if you want to find uh, more amazing educational content from Matt Falloon, his uh, some of his stuff is available over at Balloon Artist College. Uh, there's yes. also a link down in the description below for a special offer for Balloon Artist College for folks. Um, and, it's actually the most uh, cost-effective way to catch up on my back catalog um, by right. far. So for one-off payment, you get everything that I released up to Bopups. And I think it's like 99 bucks, and, and it's, it's a huge savings, including some stuff that was never actually released on uh, DVD or anything like that, just stuff I'd made for conventions and sort of like a complete back catalog. That's great. Um, 
thank you so much for sharing that stuff. Um, Welcome. Matt, we are getting, we're nearing the end, but we okay. cannot, we cannot leave here today because <laughs> I am deeply excited. Okay. So for folks at home, if you follow Matt Falloon on social media, um, is, if you've been posting it on Facebook or your Instagram. I, it's, it's, it's been my, my personal Instagram, not my, um, not my balloon Instagram. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, but anyway, if you, if you do follow Matt, you probably have seen some of the pictures. If you don't, this is going to be a big, a big, really cool surprise. So this Ugh. is an incredibly exciting, holy, oh my God. Okay, well, hold up. I was, I wanted to play the slide whistle right before it came out. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I feel like the ascending tone is more suitable. Oh my! Okay, we're gonna biggie screen you. What? What is this thing called? This is the Zorg Industries ZF1, which I'm a massive movie nerd. And if you've seen The Fifth Element, this is The Fifth Element is is like Jaws. It's almost the perfect move, movie. It's not. Yeah. It's perfectly paced. The tone is sensible yet fun. Um, it, it gets you emotionally involved and then at exactly the right moment throws some comedy beat at you that, that catches you off guard. <laughs> it's just, it's incre It's one of the few movies where the antagonist and protagonist never meet. Bruce Willis and Gary Oldman never share a scene in that film. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but very obviously the good guy and bad guy. It's, it's, it's this incredible movie and it breaks the Hollywood mo mo mold because the guy that made it, Luc Besson, is French. And he makes, so, like, uh, Valerian was the most expensive foreign film. I say foreign in inverted, graphic, inverted commas because the standard right. is Hollywood. But, um, but, yeah, Valerian was this hugely expensive foreign film that Luc Besson made based on French content matter, which is probably why it didn't do it that well. But, anyway, The Fifth Element is oh, one of the most Oh, my goodness. Films. All right, walk us through this. What? Okay. Uh, well, first, tell us about the props in its its place in the film and then kind of walk us through building it. So it is, uh, you got big bad guy trying to get hold on the stones that form the ultimate weapon, which is going to stop evil from destroying the universe. And he right. is on the payroll of evil, therefore wants to get the stones and thwart any, uh, any good guys getting the stones and stopping evil. Um, so he hires the Mangalores, who are these alien things, to steal the stones, and they come back with an empty crate that the stones used to be in, inside. So the scene is basically Zorg showing up saying, thank you very much for getting my stones and helping me ruin the universe. As payment, you get three crates of these ridiculous TV shopping network uh, weapons. <laughs> and there's this amazing scene where he goes through the different features of this gun. It's got a net launcher. It's got a flamethrower. It's got an ice cube system. <laughs> it's got a missile launcher. It's got a replay function, which means one bullet shot to a target means that every single bullet will track back to that target. And it's right. just this amazing shot, like a sales spiel that he does on this weapon. Um, you should just look it up. It's, it's the tiniest, like two minute YouTube clip, uh, right down to, um, Oh gosh, the, the, the red button on the underside of the gun, which um, I don't want to I don't want to ruin it, but uh, it's it's got a it's got a pivotal role in the in the moment. Um, yeah, well, don't, so, not too many spoilers. Yeah, it was it was one of these sort of dream props, and I think for a lot of builders, it was one of these dream props. And ever since that movie came out, there's a online resource called the Replica Prop Forum, who share ideas and 3D files and sketches and and uh, gosh, I've bought. From users on the Replica Prop Forum, I've bought my original Chucky doll head that I made the Chucky doll with. And, and oh, yeah. I've had all sorts of interactions with Replica Prop Forum. And this, as a running theme, is one of the most popularly requested uh, props. There's a couple of people making kits of them, and there was one guy who made a complete 3D printable file of this, which is what I based this on. And like I said, the problem with 3D printing is you start to not want to use 3D printing because every mm. single piece. So the only printed parts of this is really the carapace. There's, there's these sort of tan colored pieces um, right. because it takes a long time. You've got to join all the pieces together. So this main body piece is about four different prints welded together. And then once wow. you've got that, you've got to sand it and 
fill it and and make it smooth and make it look like a single piece that's not 3D printed. So right. you start to not want to use 3D printing after a while. So this is really just assembled from from junk and scrap. Uh, wow, few, really? Yeah, so um, the oh, original wow. prop was put together from junk and scrap, mind you. So it makes it, it makes this kind yeah. of accurate. Um, yeah. So, for example, the the little flame launcher here—I don't know if you can see that very close—but yeah. uh, that's just the head of a butane torch. You know, like you make creme brulee with the little kitchen <laughs> butane torches. And the the yellow rocket right there in the middle is a yeah. model rocket that you can buy and launch, and it comes down on a little parachute. But once the fan base of this prop discovered those two pieces, people started scaling the whole prop and recreating the whole prop just from these two size references. Oh, so they'd okay. find this part and they'd find this part and they'd pull a whole bunch of stills from the film and recreate the whole thing based on just a few little, uh, uh now this, little this is a fascinating subject cause I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Adam Savage as mm -hmm. I'm sure you are. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've seen him kind of go through that meticulous process of looking at hundreds of stills from the film trying to measure things based off of other measurements. It's crazy. He, he was actually, Adam, Adam Savage's tested site was one of the reasons that I wanted to make this because he, he'd yeah. made a bunch of these and sent them to Gary Oldman and all sorts of things. So yeah. uh, I started 3D printing and then I discovered that 3D printing looked garbage for metallic parts because there's still very limitations on how metallic a finish you can get out of paint when it's going under plastic. And when I visited Sam, actually probably on, on the tour, I saw that he had one of the little mini lathes. And so I bought myself one of those and I taught myself to turn metal. So all of these parts here, so the, the ice cube system down here and the, and the, flame, uh, the flame nozzle there, uh, oh, these little sensors crazy. down here, that's all turned aluminium and brass, which adds to the weight. This is, I don't know, this is probably about... Uh, it, yeah, it looks like it's got real heft to it. It's like I can tell by the way you're holding it. Uh, Two-handed job. And... Again, just buying all the different tools. So this is, I don't know, I can see if I can line it up. This has got a little laser <laughs> yeah. uh, in there. Um, the, it's got an LED chaser. I don't know if you can see that top panel there. It's got a little LED. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just like one of the, like, uh, we have a, an electronics retailer, like, like a um, Radio Shack kind of set that used to do the right. Knight Rider scanner. You could buy the LED scanners from Knight Rider. So that was just uh, that, and I just hacked it. So I just wired the, se the LEDs in a slightly different sequence to make that right. happen. Um, it's, it's amazing the stuff you can get just well, online to start with, but just from, just from consumer stores. There's, there's so much stuff you can get hold of. The, uh, the darts on the side, now you can see the, uh, the dart launcher there. Right. They are Nintendo 3DS styluses. <laughs> so all of the Nintendo nerds will, will recognize those. I just painted the tips gold, mainly because wow. I didn't want to have to turn 10 uh, identical pieces. So yeah, this is, this is the latest this, thing, and it, it lives yeah. in my lounge room on the wall, mounted to a toilet seat, which I painted it's, yellow. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm really blown away by this. Just like the the level of detail, the intricacy, the, the how you can tell how really hefty it actually is. Yeah. Well, I have a um, I've, I've I've had a CNC machine for years, and I've never really given it a good run. So I used it to make all of the aluminium panels. So all these pieces in here are actually metal cut panels. Um, that is this cross strut here is uh, uh, acrylic. So just like um, perspex that I have a laser cutter that I cut that right. on. And this is what I'm saying, like. Over the years that I've been doing this stupid stuff, I've built my tool collection to a point where something like this isn't all that unreasonable to put together with enough time right. and consideration. The, the black barrel here is a modular table leg that I bought from the, uh, that I bought from the hardware store, and I just got a piece of um, it's a plumbing cap. So that's the table leg in there, and I just put a plumbing cap on top and sit that in place, and, and that gives me the... Uh, the the gun barrel so it's all this <laughs> this strip here is the most annoying bit this piece of brushed aluminium here uh -huh. that cost me about thirty dollars just that little strip and it's because my lathe went out of uh out of commission so i couldn't turn my own one i wanted to get this thing finished and i just went into the hardware store and looked at 
plumbing fittings, light fittings, like hose cap <laughs> fittings, anything that I could find that would kind of get close. And I found this uh, cheap hanging light fitting, which I, I bought this big box, cut the tiniest little thing off, threw the rest of it away, and, and got that little, uh, that little aluminum ring there. So, yeah. It, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sometimes you gotta skip. Yeah, people like us never go into a hardware store with like, yeah, sorry, employee, you probably can't help me right now. Oh, the the drama I went through trying to find flexible steel conduit to run that those oh, wow. those two tubes that run down there. Um, I ended up having to buy it secondhand off the Australian equivalent of uh, Craigslist that somebody had pulled out of a construction site because they just don't import that diameter into Australia anymore. But I had to find it, so yeah. So yeah, this and how far how far will you go to make sure that a specific part is like the right measurement not, or proportion? Not as far as many will. In the sure. end of the day, I, I'm making so another philosophy that I abide by is finished is better than perfect. Because if you want everything perfect, you'll never finish a project, and I'm I'm guilty of not finishing a lot of projects. So once I yeah. once I adopted the idea that finished is better than perfect, I found that a lot of my projects were starting to wrap up. And it was because I didn't sweat the tiny little details quite so much. So there's a lot of stuff on this that is inaccurate. But to the person who comes into my theater room and looks around and goes, holy hell, is that the gun from The Fifth Element? They're not going to turn around and say, yeah, but that bit's a darker shade of red in the film. So, right. you know, I, <laughs> I'm keen to get it right to a, to a reasonable attempt. And then, but yeah, there's some people who, um, the Han Solo blaster community, people who've made Han Solo's gun, uh, they will go right down to getting the original, like a, a um, I think it was an original German Kluger. It was a, it was an actual German pistol, and they right. will dent match it. So they will get freeze frames of the film and actually dent the gun in exactly the right places <laughs> to match the dents in the film. It's crazy what people go to, but yeah. yeah. Um, can we can we have one more uh, slow look at her? Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, a little step back. Wow. So we got. Yeah, give us a quick tour overview. Yes, God, look at this. It's gorgeous, absolutely stunning, yeah, man. From the other, the other side. <laughs> I'm just waiting to drop this thing on film. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. And I mean, we have to. I, I have to have you back at some point in a more mobile fashion. Maybe Skype with you over by phone, uh, and take a tour of some of the. Uh, amazing installations and things you built in your house uh, your, <laughs> yeah your bookshelf your bar i mean everything I, uh, you are i've never you use your skills to improve your life uh, in I've so never many ways why people lose the enthusiasm to have a magical house when they get older because when you're a kid yes. you're like, i'm gonna have secret passages and a ballroom and a big tv and all yes. this stuff and when you're an adult you buy this it's not even an investment. You, you literally pay money for the shelter over your own head mm -hmm. and people leave it the way they found it. And they don't <laughs> make it their own and they don't like ad modify it and adjust it. And listen, I understand that property market, I'm, I'm very lucky, I'm very privileged. I had parents that could help and I, got, and I bought at the right time and I would never be able to get into the housing market being a full-time entertainer now. Right. Just wouldn't happen in Australia. But now that I'm in, I use this as an opportunity. I walked into my house for the first time and said, see that wall? That's my wall. I can put a hole in that wall if I want. And you know what? Look, there's a hole in my wall because the wall cavity was too skinny to fit my flush mount speaker. So I had to cut a hole through the other side of the wall. It became a whole thing. But it's my wall. I can do that. If I want to make... You know, if I want to hang an orangutan from the ceiling, I can do it. It's my house. I can do this thing. <laughs> you, uh, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, Matt Falloon says, it's, if it's your wall, cut a hole in that wall. Cut a hole. Dang it. Cut a, I can put holes in my floor, like old floorboards, and I'm like, I want something there. I'm just going to put the circular saw through that and do it. Yeah. Make sure you have the skills to do it before you just do it. But still... I don't understand why people don't make these these fantasy houses of their dreams and live in. Right. Well, uh, uh, you I know the, like the, the mantra like the mantra of my show is um, hashtag apparently I can, uh, which <laughs> right. essentially is uh, a month and a half ago I said can I just make my own talk show uh, and then uh, apparently I did. 
so this yeah. this fits right in with everything that I'm trying to do with my life. Um, uh, Matt, this is amazing. I I feel like we could keep this going all night long, to be honest with you. Um, I'll come back. But you're going to have to come back. Matt Falloon will definitely back, be back on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the, the the chats, I occasionally poked over to look at the chats, and we people are really... Uh, we got called nerds several times uh, in here. That's fine. Do you want to see something nerdy? Do yeah. you want to see something nerdy before I go? Oh, please. Hang on, I have, to take my head, I have to take my headphones off. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, I will use this moment here. I'll, I'll read the credits while he's gone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Falloon's going to be back in right, one right, second. Right. We're going to say goodbye. Oh, no, here we go. Okay. He's back. So there's a guy in the States who makes Chucky doll replicas. Yeah. And I've made my own Chucky doll replica. I've bought parts from him. I've gotten advice from him, and I've done it myself. Um, he had made up a whole run of the fabric of the overalls. So it was like screen accurate, same color fabric, same sort of corduroy, same sort of thing. Anyway... He made up a suit jacket in the good guy's oh, get out. fabric. And he used to wear it to conventions, and, and, he, and he sold it. And I'm like, I'll buy it. it this, is, this is for me. So <laughs> next time I see you, buddy, we are going to be blazer buddies, and I'm going to wear my, my good guy's jacket. That is perfect. And, yeah, that that is about the height of nerdiness right there. It's amazing. I love this thing. It's great. <laughs> And it kind of fits. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Now you now you look like you're actually taking my show seriously. I appreciate that. Oh yeah, yeah. This is awesome. this is prime nerd territory. No, I don't care. I like being called a nerd. It's it's a badge of honor. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing everything with us today. Um, what's your um, what's your website or Facebook or contact info? If folks want to get If you want to book me for a children's party, you can go to mattfalloon.com.au. If you want to talk to me about literally anything else, find me on Facebook usually. Um, if we're not friends already, send me a friend request. Let's just send me a message or whatever you want, and um, and we can have a chat. Yes, and take it from me, Matt is a very friendly person, uh, as long as you're not a weirdo. <laughs> awesome. Matt Falloon, thank you so much for joining the show today. We're going to say wave goodbye to Matt Falloon. Uh, folks watching at home, thank you so much for watching, for joining in, participating in the live chat. Lots of fun comments in there. If you want to get the invite and notification whenever I do a live show, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash Dave Bren. Uh, the show is a production of Dave Bren Media Inc. My theme music is by Adi Somek and the Unpopable Trio. Graphics by Jonathan Wilson. Uh, and our show is executive produced by Baby Shark the Cat and paid for by viewers like you. Thanks for watching. We did it! Hey! That's it, Matt! The show's over! Woo. Yeah, you can you can take the jacket off now. Good news and bad news. The bad news is the show's over. The good news is the show's over! Yay! <laughs> <laughs>